Okay. Uh, as far as the collectability of this game, uh, we I, am I safe to say, and, and I felt it was there was enough in the basic package to play the game forever, really. Oh yeah. If you're just if you're, I mean, the average family as a family card game who's played Uno, let's say, they would be able to play this game forever. Yeah. There'd be no need for them to buy boosters unless they they just wanted to do it to see what the other dispensers look like. But as far as gameplay, no. Um, if you're in the little more harder core of gaming, you might want to see the dispensers just to see the extra actions that they can give you. The game becomes much more strategic with the boosters, um, but certainly not necessary uh, to enjoy the game. Okay, hey, but once again, with respect to the collecting part of it, this game isn't like other games like Magic the Gathering and many other Pokemon-type games that are also collectible because when you buy cards, you're not improving your hand. You're improving the game for everybody. That's correct. This is a cooperation, kind of a cool thing, where you're just going to make the game a little bit different for everyone. Everyone plays on an even playing field, no matter how many boosters they've bought. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't help the richest player, and I, and I find that very satisfying. As, and so we picked up a couple boosters, and I just opened one up now, so I'm not sure which one the rare one is. Uh, but the, the the artwork's pretty clear, and, and the game is very easily played across the table, even for blind old people like me. Uh, but seriously, that's very important because I can see the colors, I can see what's going on everywhere in the game, and, and to me that makes the game more enjoyable. Well, well, that's what we try to do is find something very simple for families to enjoy. And uh, it's, you know, it turns out it's a lot of fun. I mean, the Fez dispensers are part of all our childhoods, and they're still around today. And all these dispensers in the game are actual original Fez dispensers. What we're going to be coming out with later are expansion sets with some of the licensed dispensers like Star Wars and Looney Tunes and that kind of thing. Well, Mike, uh, just uh, I think we've covered a little bit of uh, Pez, but I, I did want to talk you. You've done other collectible card games. Is that true? Yes, I have. My first game ever that I published was Wyvern, which is a trading card game based on dragons I and, that. and mythology. Uh, and that brought me to the attention of Wizards of the Coast, because that was early on in the trading card game. And it took another three to four years, but they finally done two more of my trading card games. They asked me to do wrestling, which I did. The Nitro uh, um, a card game is mine. And also the X-Men trading card game based on the movie, which just came out, is also mine. So, And I'm working on some things for them next year. So um, trading card games are sort of the most profitable part of my game design. But um, You mean from your perspective or...? Or, yes, from from games, or from sales in general? From sales in general. Well, a good a trading card game will, will make a lot of money for a designer. Uh, a bad game doesn't make money, whether it's a trading card game or, <laughs> or regular. <laughs> and I've had a few of those in my time, which we won't mention. But um, certainly the trading card game that does well will make a lot more than the regular game that does well. So um, I, I enjoy the challenge of a trading card game. They're very hard to do, and they're very time-consuming to do well. And I, I take a lot of pride in that. I also love doing regular games, which I continue to do also. Well, just off off the top, why is it harder to, to design a, a collectible card game? Is it that you have to have something that is expansive or potentially expansive? Well, in Mystery Rummy, case number one, I have 62 cards. Um, and in a trading card game, you want to get about 250 oh, cards. Oh, sure. So, that's, that's the first big difference. Then the problem is you have to play those cards in any combination that makes sense against each other in all these different deck configurations to try to make sure that there's not a strategy, one strategy that wins the game. And um, what we try to do is make sure that the rare cards are not the cards that will just win for people, that they're just a little more focused for certain strategies. But all of that takes a lot of playtesting. So, you know, trading card games just take a lot of time to playtest. There was a problem with the Nitro game. Could you, are you allowed to discuss that? Sure. Actually, there isn't any, any gag order. Um, it's been settled. I can give you a brief overview. It's one that of those, would be nice. It's one of those misunderstandings and people, you know, maybe trying to get away with something. But in the end, um, well, here's what happened. Uh, the WWF, I had a friend who uh, works with WWF, and he knew I designed games. And he said, we're trying to get a trading card game together. Would you like to design a submission? So I said, sure. So I was working on the submission. They didn't contract me or anything. Uh, they said they'd also have some other submissions. And I was working with Comic Images, which is a small company in New Jersey. And they were going to actually 
actually to produce the game. During this time period, Wizards of the Coast called me because they had gotten the WCW license to do Nitro. So they asked me if I would be interested in showing them the game, and they first asked if I was under any contract yet with the WWF, and I said, no, I wasn't. So I went to WWF because they had asked me to do it first, and I said, I got a call from Wizards of the Coast, and they want to see the game too. And uh, I said, if you pay me something now and sign me, I won't show it to them. Uh, they said we'd rather not do that because we haven't seen all the games yet. We like yours, but you know they—they're not a game company, so I think their their feeling was that any of the games would would probably work fine, and um, they thought the license was more important than the game. So I went to Wizards of the Coast and showed it to them, and they flipped over it and they bought it on the spot. And then the WWF said, "Okay, we'll, we'll look for something else." When I let them know that, well, it turns out we we discovered a couple months before. Uh, the games were coming out, that they had actually used the basis for my design for their design. At least that's what it looked like from the advertisements they were running. So we sued them to start, to not bring the game out at all. Um, and they came to the table, and there was a settlement reached where my name appears on the box of the WWF game. It's called Raw a Deal, and it says a design, a contribution by, uh, by Mike Fitzgerald. We also had them delay it, and they also have to pay... Wizard of the Coast, and through Wizard of the Coast, me, uh, for the sale of the game. Oh, okay. Uh, so it was a, it was a settlement. Um, on their behalf, because I don't want to leave the impression that they just did something crooked, I really don't think they were aware that a game idea is an important piece of art and is, is something that uh, can't be stolen without payment. I think I have had this, this discussion with many non-game companies, and it's important to get this across for all of us that love games, is that the a game design idea is a unique concept and an idea, and it may not be copyrightable all the time. It may not be be patentable. In fact, once you release a game to the public, anybody can, can take the ideas as they will. But before it gets released, it is the property of, of, of the designer. So they did change my design quite a bit, and I don't think they maliciously thought, well, let's just rip Mike off. I think they really thought, well, this is probably the way a wrestling game should be, so let's just borrow some of these ideas and make our own. And well, I'm, I'm really glad. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I, I'm really glad you got a chance to clear some of that up. It's been on the Internet, and you never know what the truth is. Uh, we'll pick up on some of this and uh, hopefully talk about some of your collectible card games down the road, and certainly Mystery Rummy too. Uh, again, this was uh, Pez the Game and a little bit of an interview with Mike Fitzgerald. Uh, I want to thank you for watching. My name is Bob Schwartz, and for Mike Fitzgerald, uh, thanks again.